Eddie. We're super stoked to talk to you. Um, one of the main reasons is obviously, you know, wrestling is uh, what geographical, territorial, and, and you seem like the most New York City wrestler, <laughs> maybe in the history of the history of the hi history of history. Oh, I don't know. I, I I look at guys like Homicide and the Brooklyn Brawler, man. I don't know. <laughs> Those are New Yorkers. Okay, okay. Brooklyn Bro Yes, you need, maybe we, we should get a a borough in your name somehow. Then then that. Puts yeah, there you go. Place. There you go. The Yonkers Brawler or something. Yeah. 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 Not yeah. Even, yeah. There you go. Um, can, can you take us back to what you grew, growing up in what, Yonkers, right? Well, no, I was born in uh, the Bronx, and I grew okay. up on University Avenue, but then moved to Yonkers when I was about. Second grade, okay. Bianca, so, but still hung out in the Bronx and Woodlawn growing up, and then hung out in like Bainbridge growing up. So, and that's kind of something I wanted to talk about later, but we might as well talk about it now because because you kind of touch every kind of part of the tri-state area, right? It's funny, Kirk, because like News Twelve, we got you know we talk tell people, oh, there's News Twelve the Bronx, there's News Twelve Brooklyn, there's yep. News Twelve, yep. there's News Twelve in Yonkers, yeah. Let's just rename Eddie it News Twelve Eddie Kingston. It, yeah, I'm work. saying Eddie Kingston's life and wrestling career has basically touched every single one of those areas, right, Eddie? Yeah, I wrestled in, in every one of the boroughs and, and all that stuff, and I like I like representing them. You know what I mean? I, I speak the lingo. You know what I mean? The because every borough has their own, you know, slang. I learned them all. Hung out with every everybody from all this. You know what I mean? So yeah, I like repping New York, man. I love New York. I'm I'm biased. Man, ain't nothing like home. Ain't nothing like New York, Eddie. Man. Of course there isn't. And look, we were talking about that. You're coming back to the New York area now. The show at, in Queens was such a success and such a moment for so many talents, including yourself. Can you yeah. just take us through what that show was like and what it's like to be back here now again and trying to follow up on the success of that show? Yeah, well, uh, I'm first of all, I'm confident that we're going to follow up on that show and be even bigger and, and you know, Strong Island, where it's going to be even better. But uh, that day is still a blur to me. I still haven't sat down and thought about it. You know what I mean? And like really comprehended what we did, you know, Queens. But I do remember the day being very stressful. I do remember that being very, very stressful. Was that family members and you know what I mean? Just at athletic commission, all that. It just, it was a very stressful day. That's all I can say without getting myself in trouble. Did, have you at least watched it back? Like watched you coming out and the no, I never watched it. No, I never watch anything back. I never, never watch it back. Once it's done, it's done. Yeah, yeah. I know what, what your I family did wrong. I know what I though. did right. What happened? What your family members tell you though? What did everybody who was there tell you about it then? Oh, they just had a blast. They couldn't believe it. My mom was in tears. My dad was happy. You know what I mean? So that's always cool. You know what I mean? Like to see that, and because my parents suffered with me. You know what I mean? My parents seen me struggle and no mother or father wants to see their son or daughter struggle. You know what I mean? And they wanted me to do different things. They, My dad wanted me to stay in the local 580 in the union. He wanted me to leave wrestling. But you know what I mean? They they, they were just proud and it was great to see that on their face. Eddie, I I, I told you we, we, we read that article in the Players' Tribune. It was... So, uh, you know, you kind of poured your heart out there and, and it was to, to me, I, I see that that's going to help a lot of people. It seemed like maybe writing it even even helped yourself. Um, the, the the couple things that I wanted to kind of pinpoint was. Uh, let's see, there was there was a lot, so we're not going to do all of them, but <laughs> but but you mentioned, uh, you know, the depression and, and how wrestling was kind of was kind of there always. And, and yeah. there was always people there, too. I mean. The darkest time, it it seems like that may be a couple times, right? I mean, basically twenty years, right? Your your wrestling career starts two thousand two. Here we are, twenty twenty one. Last twenty years, is there is there a rock bottom for you, or or is that happened a couple times? Obviously, you fought yeah, out of it. So. Uh, the one, wow, there's been a couple of rock bottom moments mentally, mentally, uh, but there was one that was mentally, mentally, mentally. Uh, physically and uh, emotionally rock bottom. I just got out of a very bad, toxic, uh, emotionally and physically draining relationship. And I went back and I tried to mask my feelings through drinking a lot, like a lot. And uh, 
got in trouble, got into a little bit of a fight. <laughs> at, at my age, I was like, why am I fighting? <laughs> but uh, I was in a holding cell and I looked at the holding cell and I saw some graffiti that I saw when I was 18. I'm the, and I said, I'm, I'm back here at 30, whatever, six it was. And I was like, no, something has to change. This is not, either I'm getting out of wrestling or I'm making it, something has to change because I can't, I can't do this anymore. You know what I mean? So that was definitely the lowest of the low was that, was that point. It, it sounds like that was relatively recent as opposed, uh, compared to when you started, you had, you had that first oh, match with Cody. Yeah, I, 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 honestly, I say it was about four, four years ago, maybe tops, okay. close to the five. You know what I mean? And it was right. just a, it was just a bad state. And uh, honestly, to tell you, I don't know how I got myself out of it. I know I just had my parents were there for me. There was never any judgment from them. They were just like, yeah, well, this is life. You know what I mean? Tough it out. We'll help you. But you're still gonna, it's still gonna be tough. You know what I mean? And uh, the few friends I do have, because I have a very small circle, very small. And uh, the few friends I do have, the ones who stuck by me were like, no, nah, man, we got you, let's go. You know what I mean? And I was, I've, I've been lucky and blessed for that. You know what I mean? I've had people turn on me and I've had right. people who I thought were good people turn out not to be, but I've, I've been blessed to have like at least one, my man, Homicide one strong guy that's been there from the get-go and won't go anywhere. And trust me, I've tried that. I've tried to push him away and he just laughs. It, it seems like th there's a couple of people throughout your life that, that obviously touched, touched you. Yeah. You, you spoke about him in, in the player's tribune article. Um, but, but if we could just fast forward a couple of years then. So obviously that happens in the article. What was so interesting to me was, while you're getting this shot with AEW after you have the match in New Jersey and they call you up and it's kind of, it seems like from the outside looking in, like this is happening. This, this is your moment. And you, yeah. you said, while it was happening, you didn't know you said uh, the quote I wrote was there was no eight mile moment. You were just living through it. And, and yeah. I mean, as it's happening on the outside, I guess people could probably tell. And obviously when the whole sign Eddie Kingston movement kind of happened, it was in apparent, ten. but that night you were just there for what? A paycheck, you said, just, just, just yeah. To... It was a paycheck. It was a book. Yeah. yeah, that's all it was. I had no, uh, I had no inkling or intent. What I'm not inkling. I had no intention of looking at this as, oh, this is it. I have to do this. Oh my god, I'm getting a job. No, my job was go in, wrestle Cody, make Cody look like a million bucks. He does the same to me. We move on to the next show. That's it. That's the way you're supposed to do it. That's the way I was taught to do it. You look at everything as another booking until you get signed. And that's but, it. But but as somebody who's at that time, what, nearly two decades being a professional wrestler, mm -hmm. you didn't think like, I'm pretty good at this. Like, I know what I'm no. doing. This, this, no, is, this no. could be something. I, I have one of the lowest self-esteem you'll ever meet in your life. I'm Because I always feel like I could be better. I okay. always feel like that, either with how I look with my body, because everyone likes to say, you know, I'm fat, whatever. You know what I mean? Or uh, I can always learn something new in the ring and get better. You know what I mean? And then get to the people emotionally. You can always get better, man. This, the, I like to tell people, this is not my final form. My final form is when I'm in the grave. <laughs> so every day I can get better at something. You know what I mean? It can be positive and negative, but I'm getting better at something, you know? That's what I believe. Eddie, to that point, to that point of what you were just talking about, getting better, you know, you always come off on screen and when you are not on screen as someone who's not just happy to be there. You're someone who's there to constantly improve and want to move on to that, you know, continue, as you said, continue to improve. So what is your goal in AEW? What is your goal here with the company? Where do you want to get to? Real simple. It's real simple. Be the world champion. Be the world champion of the only professional wrestling company in America. You know what I mean? It's just called the way it is and be the top guy. That's the whole point of us being here. If to me, again, mm -hmm. just my opinion, if you're not in this sport to be a, a world champion or the world's champion, then what's the point? What's Fair the enough. Point of being but now, you're just, now you're just playing around and we don't need people to play around. We need people to go in there and professional wrestle. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Eddie, Dan, real quick, Dan, real quick, I just want to mention, because I know you, I saw an interview you just did recently. One of your yes. friends and your close circles is John Moxley, and that's someone who's going through something right now. Um, yeah. You poured your heart and soul out in the Players' Tribune. John Moxley's been very private, and very quiet, but has at least let the fans know what's going on with him. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on what he's going through and what your message has been to him through this time. Uh, you know what I mean? I told Moxley before he went, you know, and did what he had to do. I told him, man, none of this matters. Only thing that matters is your wife and your kid. I don't even matter. You have to do this for them. And I got your back regardless, whether you go or not, I'm here. And he was like, okay, man. He's very, he's very one word answered with everybody. So <laughs> yeah, for someone like Mox, you gotta be able to, uh, you gotta be able to read between the lines. So when he right. says, oh, okay, man, yeah, you're right. It's not just that. It's a, other things he's saying to you, but no, I'm proud of him. And uh, he's showing, I don't know, he's showing everybody, look, man, we're all flawed. Men can be flawed. We're allowed to be. But what we're not allowed to be is flawed and not change it, not try to work on it. That's not right. You know what I mean? So I'm proud of him. He's taking the right healthy steps so he can be around me. I'm big into this so he can be around for his daughter. You know what I mean? When it, when it right. comes to kids, you know what I mean? We can make, trust me, we'll make money regardless, you know? <laughs> Eddie, uh, one thing, and, and may I say, you are a great writer because in that Players' Tribune piece, like you literally lured me in. And, and Kurt, this is how he did it. Ready? I'm going to I'm gonna ruin, I'm gonna ruin your brain right now. It was a ghost writer. I just talked to the guy for like two and a half hours. Well, there you go. You said it. I mean, look, then, I'm, I, I don't read books anymore. I listen to them on the on the, on the the iPad. So what's the difference? Yeah. Right? He just, um, he, sent, he just sent it to me and I edited stuff out. Like, man, I wouldn't say that. Man, I wouldn't say that. Nope, that's not me. <laughs> and the guy was great about it. So Well, you, you, had, the, you had the my guy at the beginning, which is a, an infamous New York City that's it. That was definitely so me. That was you. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but the other thing, Kurt, that, that Eddie did was he started getting me reminiscent to like, you know, I don't know if you did this. You, you probably did. But, you know, what? we're like before teenagers, maybe I'm in a freshman, sophomore in high school, and I'm staying up until like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. to watch ECW on MSG. Yep. I think it was on, I mean, something that was like way up. On it, was, it was on yeah. MSG for maybe two weeks, and then it went to the Christian channel, then back to MSG. It there all depends when Paul paid sent, out. paid and sent the tape out. You know what I mean? God bless you, Paul. I never met him. Whatever, I don't know him. But, you know, he did what he had to do to get that company going. Keep it and, going, and, you know? And, you know, obviously at the time, it felt so new and different and, you know, felt like you probably shouldn't have been watching it, especially if you were our age. And, and yeah, you definitely weren't. I, figured. I started by saying something else Eddie's good at, and I was talking about talking on the mic because... I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, either of you, there's nobody that I feel kind of like it's just more real and just, you know, I, I love The Rock. We all love The Rock. But when he cut a promo, you know, if you're going to beat somebody up, you're not going to be talking about shining shoes. You know, Eddie well, King. Maybe, hey, he, he was, though. You know what I mean? So I got to right. give him love for that. But that and, and they were, guys like Austin, Austin for sure. And you talk about ECW, there's Raven, there's Dreamer, there's Shane Douglas, there's Taz. Those Pulp Fiction montages at the end of the shows were unbelievable because it built, everybody could talk. Or at least Paul made sure everyone looked like they could talk. You know what I mean? Right, And that's right. how you built in the next show, and that's how they made money. I also come from a generation where Dusty Rhodes had to talk people into Starcade. Ric right. Flair had to talk people into the Omni. Uh, Jerry Lawler and Eddie Gilbert and Bill Dundee had to talk people in to go to the Memphis Coliseum on Monday. That's how they made their money. There was no network. There was no right. pay-per-view. There was no streaming service. You made your money on the house. So that's the generation. I was able and I was lucky enough to see that. So in my head, as a pro wrestler, first you had to be physical, but also you had to be able to talk. When I was growing up, that was the thing. And so so how did we get to here you are where you're so comfortable and stuff, where, where kind of your shtick is... There's no shtick. Like if you're no, in the ring me. or if you're on the on the street corner and you're about to get into a fight, you're probably saying the same thing. Well, because Eddie, Eddie, yeah, Eddie Kingston's me at 17 years years old turned up a thousand notches, and the reason why is because I saw Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock for like some MTV thing, 
when MTV was working with WWE, they asked them, it was like a true life thing or something. They asked them about their characters and they go, it's a piece of me, turned up a thousand notches. So in my head, two of the most recognizable professional wrestlers, two guys who made the most money, and and in my opinion, uh, Austin, who saved the company, uh, if they're saying, be you, just turned up a thousand notches, I want to be in this sport, in this business, I might as well listen and do it too. You you talked about talking people into the building. Uh, there are some people who said you and CM Punk talked a lot of people into buying full gear with your uh, segment <laughs> a couple you. weeks Thank back. You. And I mean, that, that is something people are still talking about. And even still, even after CM Punk had a whole thing with MJF a couple weeks ago. So they're still talking about your, your interaction. And then the match that followed it was just as fantastic. I, I want to know about your interactions with him. And then how difficult is it to follow up a promo and a segment that looks and comes off and appears that real with a match that equals that intensity? Um, first of all, I didn't see the thing with him and MJF because I don't like either guy, so I won't watch. I'm not going to lie to you. Plus, I'm not going to learn anything from it, so I'd rather watch Kawada and Kobashi from 1998 for the 50th time. Anyway, that's enough of me throwing shots at people. The thing with Punk, the reason why that I guess you could say the promo, and I'm, I'm using quotations, it wasn't a promo. He doesn't like me, and I don't like him. And we've had a lot of things to say to each other that we never had the chance to say to each other. We've either said it to friends, mutual friends of each other, or we just decided to ignore each other or whatever. There's a lot of other things. I'm not going to get too inside baseball on it. Right. You know what I mean? There's a lot of other stuff that went on behind the scenes that no one really needs to know. But yeah, that wasn't a promo. That was something we both wanted to say to each other for 15 years. That was 15 years of build up for both of us. So then you think, how do you follow that up with a match? It wasn't a match. We actually fought. Like, I hit him, he hit me. You know what I mean? And whatever. It was over. Came off that way. Yeah, we, it was over. We didn't shake each other's hands after the match like people do. We didn't go on Twitter and say how great and lucky we were to face each other. Punk don't like me. I don't like Punk. That's it. That's the end of it. There's no promo. There's no, let's make this up. This is reality, and that's it. When we have to get in the ring, we'll be professional, but you know for a fact we're going to take a lot of shots at each other, and that's it. If the fans enjoy it, they enjoy it. At that point, with someone like him who I don't like, I don't care if people like it or not at that point. It could have been zero people in the audience. I was going to hit them. It's, it's really it. <laughs> I, mean, I know it got off. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I wanted to just sit there for a second because it it's pretty strong <laughs> commentary. Um, no, it's the same thing with, like, there's certain people in wrestling I do not like. Right. Punk uh, is one. Punk okay. is one. Aro's another one. The big Swiss idiot at WWE, whatever. Cesaro, I know him as Claudio. I don't like him. I don't respect him. You know what I mean? He ever comes here, like, we're going to have a problem. Or whenever his contract's up, I don't even pay attention to what he does. Right. But guys like that, I just don't like, don't respect. I kind of wanted to just, just slide over a little bit. Because obviously coming up in the business for two decades, you've crossed paths, like you're talking about, with a lot of these guys that now, you know, the Brian Danielsons, the CM Punks, that now – here we are again, crossing paths, only obviously it's on a much larger scale yeah. in much bigger buildings with much more eyes on it. Is it different now when you are got a match with Brian Danielson in front of 15,000 people than it was when it was not that many? I, I, obviously, you guys are more mature and more obviously in the business. Yeah, and, more, and definitely more, more but, mature, yeah. Definitely more mature, but not. there's no difference for me because – I, it doesn't matter, honestly. I love this sport. It doesn't matter if there's three people or 30,000 people or whatever, 300,000 people in the audience. I'm going in there to fight. I'm going in there to wrestle. I'm going in there to throw a suplex, chop you, punch you, grapple. I'm just, it doesn't matter to me because this is what I love to do. I don't do, I'm not going to do anything else. So this is it. It doesn't matter who's there. It doesn't matter how many. It doesn't. My opponent, honestly, unless I don't like them like Punk and Cesaro, honestly, my opponent's faces when I'm in the ring. Oh, also the Bucks. I can't stand the Bucks. Sorry, I forgot about them. But like, like so the Bucks, Cesaro, and Punk, I see their faces. Everyone else, there's nothing. It's just a blank. It's just a person. There's nothing there. 
you, you said you're you're a wrestler. You're not gonna be anything else. But you're, you're dipping your toe into into commentary, right? And, and I'm excited about that. If if there's oh, a you, twenty years down the road, fun. Eddie yeah, the Brain Kingston, yeah. that that would be great. I I, I, I don't I know would, if they're gonna I don't know if they're gonna leave me on because I bury a lot of people on commentary. You know what I mean? I just have my own opinions, and you know, some people in the office may not like it, but they know you take you you're rolling the dice if you put me on commentary, especially live. It does seem like AEW is giving a lot of guys great opportunities like yourself, yeah. but also, like you said, giving opportunities to do more than just wrestle at the same time. And everybody we talk to from the company just raves about the atmosphere, the culture, what it's like and all that. You worked yeah. for so many different companies over the years. What is AEW like? What is it like being a part of this company, especially at this time right now? Yeah, well, you know what I mean? Again, don't like the Bucks, but I got to give them credit. They're basically the re, you know the Bucks, Cody, and Kenny are the reason why the locker room is the way it is, because they didn't want to do it the old school way. You know what I mean? They didn't want to do it where you had to walk on eggshells. You know what I mean? And scared about ever breathing the wrong way. No, they wanted a locker room where you were you would feel comfortable, but respectful. You know what I mean? And that's what we have here, and that's why a lot of people don't mess around here because they don't want to mess up the good vibe. Or the 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 more relaxedness of the locker room than other places. You know what I mean? So they come in here, and we, if we see anybody acting up, we're like, my man, we ain't letting you come in here and mess this up for us. You know what I mean? Because this is probably the best place any of us have like ever worked. You know what I mean? So we're not coming in here trying to mess it up. And if someone does come in here trying to mess it up, they're usually out the door before they even know what happens. I, I got one more, Eddie, and it's kind of off of that. Because uh, I remember after the, the Brody Lee tribute show, seeing yeah. the, the video that went viral of, of you kind of giving that speech in the locker room to the guys. And, and the I, didn't want no one to, I didn't want no one to see that, but they got me. They got me. But, but, but I mean, clearly that's, that's you in a, in a leadership role in the locker room. Ah, I hate no? people laughing in here right now. I hate being, okay. I'm not the leader. I'm not the leader. I just okay. do things. I'm not the leader. I just do things because I feel they're right. So it's just in it. you to, that you you felt yeah. like that was the time to say something. I, I just had a lot of energy in me. Uh, I saw the energy that was in that locker room that day. I saw the energy that was in that ring, and I want that energy every day, every match, every every show, because I just don't want that energy because someone passed away. I want that energy every show. That's why I said what I said. It wasn't to be a leader. We have enough. We have enough people here who are good leaders. You don't need me to be a leader. You know what I mean? I'll just be in the background, and when it's time for me to say, when I feel like saying something, I'll say it. You know, that's it. Last thing for you guys, and last thing I want to just have end on a high note, end on some fun here. Eddie, we a lot of talk right now about uh, Mount Rushmore's of professional wrestling. Oh, geez. I want to know who's on Eddie Kingston's Mount Rushmore of professional wrestling. Who are you? How did this? How did this start, by the way? How did this Mount Rushmore thing start? Who who he started? started and then Undertaker and Rock did it recently, and H Hogan. Everybody's giving their Mount Rushmores now. I did so, see the Rock give one. one. Yeah, yeah. Ah, Mount Rushmore. Huh? It all it all depends. I'm just gonna go with my personal favorites. How about that? Not the people yeah. who drew the most yeah. money. Not the yeah. people who made the most impact in the business. Just my personal favorites. Uh, the f honestly, it's the four pillars of uh, Old Japan Pro Wrestling: Kawada, Tawei, Masawa, and Kobashi. There you go. There's my Mount Rushmore right there. Okay. Old Japan '90s and and some when they went to Noah. You know what I mean? That's it, right there. There's your Mount Rushmore. For me personally, because those are the guys I still watch to this day. I just watched Masawa and Tawei from '96 or '95 the other day on the phone. So. So when you get the chance to go in the ring with those guys, they seem like there's a lot more of of of, of that style of wrestlers in AEW now. Is that something that maybe is not faceless when you face a guy that oh I, I, this guy kind of wrestles like this guy I remember watching when I was a teenager? It, None of them. That, and honestly, honestly, no one wrestles like them. Okay. No one will ever wrestle like them. I love them to death. Kobashi is my personal favorite. Kawada, I feel like I'm a kindred spirit with Kawada. But no one wrestles like them. No one will ever be them. That's the benchmark. I'm trying to be better than them, not to be like them. Because okay. no one can ever be like Kobashi or Kawada, Masawa, or Tawe ever again. I'm trying to be better than them. And look, I'll probably never reach that. But if I get close, that means I'm doing pretty good. 
I'd say that, that's my Mount Rushmore. Put that on the clickbait. Compare it to the rocks. I'm oh, we're joking. going. We're care. going to Eddie. We're going. I don't will. care. Honestly, <laughs> I don't know the Rock. I don't know the Undertaker. I don't know Hulk Hogan. So I don't care. There you go. If I don't know you, I don't care. Sorry, <laughs> I just don't. 